CSS Atlanta was an ironclad transformation effort which used the iron hull and Scottish-built engines of the SS Fingal to fashion one of the Confederacy's most powerful warships. The ironclad was frankly not so imposing. CSS Atlanta had a deep draft which limited its operational area below Savannah. This, coupled with a very rash and reckless captain, Commander William Webb, resulted in Atlanta's capture after a brief engagement with the monitors USS Weehawken and USS Nahant. The CSS Ironclad soon became the USS Atlanta and served until 1865 in the James River. The merchant ship was built for and operated by Hutchinson's West Highland Service until purchased by Commander James Bullock, one of the Confederate agents operating in Great Britain. He described Fingal as a new ship, had made one or two trips to the north of Scotland, was in good order, well founded, and her log gave her a speed as thirteen knots and good steaming weather. Bullock arranged for Fingal to secure British officers and crew. The ship was loaded and slipped out of Greenock, Scotland on October 8, 1861. When Fingal reached St. George, Bermuda, Bullock met with Lieutenant Robert Pegram, captain of the commerce raider CSS Nashville, and secured the services of that ship's pilot, John Mackin. Bullock induced all of the British officers and crew to stay with the ship and help run the blockade into Savannah. The Fingal was able to pass into Wausau Sound during the foggy night of November 12, 1861. When Fingal reached Savannah, there was great joy as the sea steamer was the first ship to run the blockade inbound loaded with supplies just for the Confederate government. The cargo was a godsend to the Confederates. The cargo consisted of 10,000 Enfield rifle muskets, 1 million ball cartridges, 2 million percussion caps, 3,000 cavalry sabers, 1,000 short rifles and cutlass bayonets, 1,000 rounds of ammunition per rifle, 500 revolvers and ammunition, a couple of large rifle cannons and their gear, and a vast amount of medical supplies and clothing material. After loading, Bullock prepared Fingal for a return voyage to Great Britain, loaded with cotton. However, the Federals learned that this blockade runner was ready to attempt an escape. Unionists had occupied Tybee Island and placed blockaders at every possible exit from Savannah. On December 23rd, Bullock took Fingal down to Wilmington Island to find an unguarded exit, but they were all vigorously guarded by Federal ships. Secretary Malloy decided in early January 1862 that Bullock should return to Great Britain by other means and that the Fingals should be converted into an ironclad ram. Malloy selected his friends Nelson and Asa Tiff to convert Fingal into an ironclad ram, the Atlanta. Mal Mallory gave the men overall control for the transformation project. They were not shipbuilders, but businessmen. Asa was the leading salvager in Key West and operated a small ship repair yard. Nelson was the founder of Albany, Georgia, and a three-term member of the Georgia House of Representatives. During the war, Nelson, when not building ironclads, was a captain in the Confederate Navy Supply Department and also provided the Confederate Army with food and other supplies. Work on the conversion began in earnest in February of 1862, and the ship was ready for trials in July of 1862. The vessel was cut down from, to her main deck, and a platform three feet in thickness was installed seven feet above the water line. Sponsons were built from the sides of the hull to support the ironclad's casemate which sloped at a 30-degree angle. The casemate was constructed of 3 inches of oak and 15 inches of pine over two layers of 2-inch iron 7 inches wide. They were laid and bolted together by bolts one and a quarter inches in diameter, countersunk with nuts and washers. The shield extended several feet below the waterline. The ship was formed into an iron beak. The bow was also fitted with a wooden pole that had a 50-foot percussion torpedo operated by an iron lever and pulleys at its end. The Atlanta was armed with two 7-inch Brook rifles weighing 15,300 pounds on pivot mounts and three gun ports at bow and stern. The broadside guns were two 6.4-inch Brook guns. All these Brook guns were single-banded. The eight gun ports were very small and only permitted slight lateral aiming and the ability to elevate the rifles from five to seven degrees. A two-inch iron port shutter protected each gun port. 
Atlanta had probably the best power plant of any co Confederate ironclad. Nevertheless, the ship had several serious problems. There was no air ventilation into the hull, especially the engine room, resulting in extreme heat and foul air. The Atlanta leaked very badly. On July 31, 1862, the ironclad went on its sea trials under the command of Lieutenant Charles H. Blair. The ironclad was slow, making only seven knots and difficult to steer. The Atlanta was commissioned on November 23, 1862, and named Flagged Officer Joshua Tattenall Savannah Squadron's flagship. Rear Admiral Samuel Francis DuPont, commander of the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron, recognized that Atlanta would soon sortie and station two monitors, the USS Monotoc and Pasek, in Osabo Sound to guard against any Confederate attack. Tattenall believed that his best course of action was to strike against the South Atlantic's blockading squadron, Port Royal Sound base, when DuPont's monitors were elsewhere. His first attempt to enter Wausau Sound was frustrated on January 5, 1863, as CS engineers had not cleared the Savannah River of obstructions. The citizens of Savannah clamored for action. Finally, on March 19th, Tattenall took the ironclad through the obstructions. According to intelligence received by the flag officer, the monitors that had once been in Oshawa and Wausau Sounds had all returned to Port Royal Sound in preparation for DuPont's ironclad attack on Charleston Harbor. Tattenall was convinced that the Union Station was key to the South Atlantic Blockading Squadron's ability to maintain its blockade. When Atlanta reached the mouth of the Wilmington River, Tattenall waited for high tide to enter Wausau Sound. Unfortunately, a small picket boat from the CSS Georgia was taken over by two disgruntled Irish, Irish conscripts who had taken a revolver from the officer's coat. They rowed the boat to Union-controlled Fort Pulaski and told the Federals all about Tattnall's plan that they had overheard from officers. Tattnall had to call off his sortie, and three monitors were returned to Port Royal. Even though Tattnall's plan was excellent and could have possibly done great damage to the Union Port Royal Sound base, the Secretary Malloy lost faith in Tattnall and replaced him with Captain Richard Lucian Page. Page was a good friend of Joshua Tattnall and only served as a commander of the Savannah Squadron for less than a month when Captain William Webb replaced him. Secretary Malloy wanted younger and more aggressive naval officers to command the Confederacy ironclads. The Secretary had created a retirement board to weed out those older officers deemed incompatible or unworthy of their rank. They were then placed on the retirement list. Of these officers was Commander William Augusta Webb. Webb joined the U.S. Navy at age 14 in 1838. Webb would be assigned to the Charleston Squadron until transferred to command the Savannah Squadron. While many believed that Webb was a very reckless young officer, many also perceived that he would at once do something. Another officer noted that Webb had orders to assume offensive actions against the enemy. He was specially promoted to give him rank enough to assume his new position. Webb accordingly came down here very much elated at his, adv his advancement. He was boastful and dis disinclined to listen to the counsel of older and wiser heads. Webb advised Malloy that he intended to strike at the Union fleet as soon as feasible. He attempted an attack in May of 1863, yet Atlanta's forward engine broke down and the deep draft ironclad ran aground. The engine was repaired and Webb indicated that he planned to use the next full tide to strike at the enemy. Mallory, in turn, told Webb not to sortie until CSS Savannah was ready to join the attack. Nevertheless, Webb disobeyed Mallory's orders to wait for the other ironclad. Webb was intent on raising the blockade, attacking Port Royal, and besieging Fort Pulaski. Before he could launch his attack, however, DuPont learned about the impending Atlanta strike, so he ordered two monitors, USS Weehawken, captained by Commander John Rogers, and the USS Nahant, commanded by Commander John Dowles, to block Wausau Sound. Webb appeared not to care about the monitors. The Atlantis commander intended to destroy one monitor with his spar torpedo and capture the other with his battery. 
On the evening of June 15, 1863, Webb steamed Atlanta across the obstructions and then coaled his ship. The next evening, he placed his ship near the entrance to the sound about five to six miles away from the monitors. At 3.30 a.m. June 17, Atlanta got underway as Webb hoped to surprise the Federal ships. Two wooden gunboats, the CSS Isendiga and the CSS Resolute, followed the ironclad. Webb believed that he would need them to tow one or both monitors back to Savannah. The Weehawken noticed Atlanta's approach at 4.10 a.m. The Rebel Ram approached the Union ship at full speed to within 1.5 miles and fired its first shot at the Weehawken, which passed over the monitor and struck near Nihant. Suddenly, Atlanta stopped. The deep draft ironclad ran aground. Webb noted that Weehawken was steaming toward the Confederate ironclad and ordered Lieutenant Bartlett to fire at the Union ironclad to stop its advance using the forward Brook rifle. Nothing, however, would stop Rogers from maintaining his course toward the stranded Confederate ironclad. John Rogers realized that the Atlanta must be aground and moved his ship to within 200 to 300 yards of the Atlanta. Then Rogers fired both guns simultaneously. The 6-inch shot passed over the Confederate ironclad. However, the 15-inch shot slammed into Atlanta's casemate, just above the port shutter, nearly abreast of the pilot house, driving the armor through, tearing away the woodwork three feet wide by the entire length of the shield causing the solid shot in the racks and everything movable in the vicinity to be hurled across the deck with such force as to knock down, wound, and disable the entire gun's crew of the port side gun. While the 440-pound shot did not penetrate, its impact was devastating, and due to the tilt of the grounding, Webb could not respond with his own Brooks gun. From Weehawken's six-inch Dahlgren, the next shot struck Atlanta's knuckle. However, it did no damage other than starting a leak. The next two shots come from the Weehawken's 15-inch shell guns. One struck the starboard side port shutter of Master Rags, gun just as it had been loaded. It broke the shutter in half, tearing up the iron plate and sending iron and wooden fragments inside, wounding half of the gun crew. The final shot hit the poor corner of the pilot house, chopping the top off and wounding two pilots. The Confederate ironclad was in trouble, as it would be pounded to pieces by both monitors' heavy shell guns. Obviously, the 14-inch shield could not stop the 15-inch shot. The ironclad was still aground, and the tide would not be at flood for another 90 minutes. The small gun ports limited Atlanta's field of fire, so the Confederate ship could not effectively return fire. Sadly, there was no choice but to surrender. The Atlanta's casualties were one killed and 16 wounded, requiring hospitalization. Many others were concussed. The Atlanta was easily pulled off the shoal and reached Port Royal Sound under its own power. Temporary repairs were conducted. The crews of the Weehawk and the Hunt and the wooden gunboat USS Cimarron shared the prize money, totaling 350000 Then the ironclad steamed to the Washington Navy Yard for further repairs. The ship's armament was switched to two 150-pounder parrot rifles in bow and stern in pivot and two 100-pounder parrot rifles amid ship. The Atlanta was assigned to the James River Flotilla, North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. The ironclad's new duty was to guard against any assault by the Confederate James River Squadron. Along with the wooden gunboat USS Dawn, the Atlanta helped repulse a cavalry attack led by Major General Fitzhugh Lee against U.S. colored troops defending Port Powhatan. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. Love it.